So basically they were trying to cover their tracks and the easiest way for them to do that was to kind of make out like the mob. And hey, hey, welcome back to Road Tripping with Rachel. I'm Rachel and welcome to the studio for this lesson. Uh, <laughs> so I am uh, working my way through the Gospel of John. So if you are a small group leader or just someone who's interested in just having kind of a very like chatty read through as we're working our way through the Gospel of John. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. But I am actually breaking chapter 12 up into three separate videos. So this because there's just so much that's in the Gospel of John and a lot of it has been at least relatively condensed to where you're dealing with like a particular topic or situation that Jesus is in but we get into John chapter 12 and when I was looking through it I was like hmm, he's dealing with like three very important things in here and the big one is like it's a continuation of chapter 11 so we're still talking about Mary Martha and Lazarus then we get into where he's talking about Greeks who go to Philip who then go to Andrew and how they come to Jesus and then we get into like what is Jesus's actual mission so those are three very different things and I thought it would be hoof me to break it up into three different sections so today's lesson we're going to be going through John chapter 12 verses 1 through 19 and then we're also going to hit on 37 through 43 uh, and then we will work on the other ones all separately so today for part one of John chapter 12 let's go back and let's just review a little bit about Mary Martha and Lazarus so Lazarus was raised from the dead this was um, a friend of Jesus's we know Mary and Martha the best because of how they uh, Martha was working 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 and then Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus that's normally what they're the most known well known for Lazarus is known as having been raised from the dead after he had already been dead for four days but we look at them as a family be that they actually do have um, a bigger role that they play now scripture doesn't go into specifics about it other than that they were friends with Jesus could be distant relatives could have been that Lazarus is one of the disciples and Mary and Martha traveled with him any of those scenarios like are possible uh, but we do know that they are siblings that they are living together they for whatever reason Mary and Martha either were younger and had never been married or they were older and had never been married or their spouses had died and there were no children if they were living with their brother so Lazarus now is hosting this dinner party he's sitting there with Jesus uh, Martha is there and she is playing the hostess so she's making sure that she's serving them she's making sure you know the food is on the table and Mary goes and pours this extremely expensive perfume on Jesus's feet and then she uses her hair to dry his feet so why is this a big deal now if you are a small group leader I would say if especially if you're in a room where you have a um, like a dry race board or something like that like I would make a big list and just start listing out like all these different reasons that this was a big deal but here are some of the ones that I thought were pretty big as to why this was important one only very specific people were supposed to be anointed primarily this would be like your priests and kings so when a priest was anointed and like officially considered like a priest not just part of the tribe of Levi then they were anointed and then we also see like the kings of Israel were anointed David Saul, so on and so forth. The next big thing that I thought of was that feet are disgusting. <laughs> people wore sandals, so, and you walked everywhere. Um, only extremely wealthy people rolled camels or donkeys or horses. And so, like, your feet were nasty and dusty. This is why it's such a big deal when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, because uh, they're nasty. <laughs> and only the lowest person in the household really would have been the person cleaning up someone else's feet. And then to turn around and use her hair, I mean, literally, <laughs> or at least um, with literature and in Western culture, like a woman's hair is kind of her crowning glory. This is why you typically see women with longer hair up until like very modern times. Uh, socially, it was demeaning. 
because here is this woman who was probably in marital age and for whatever reason one she was still living with her brother but here she is fulfilling the role of a servant and if she is the sibling of the house's owner or its master then for her to be there washing someone's feet and using her hair to do it that would be, have been considered like very demeaning or it was an act of worship so mary was giving the very best that she had she was voluntarily demeaning herself in this way to be able to worship christ and five perfume of that quality would have been like a special occasion. The perfume uh, of that quality would have been like a special occasion gift. So it would have been something you would have given at like a wedding probably from the bride to the bridegroom or vice versa. So this was something that was incredibly precious. Now we see this act, beautiful act of worship that comes from Mary. We see how Martha is serving which can also be a form of worship. We see how Lazarus is there with Jesus or um, reclining with him and just fellowshipping with him. But then like John like kind of camps to the side and is like oh and by the way here's Judas and here's what Judas has to say about the whole situation. He's like well, what about the poor? We could have sold this for like 300 denarii and then we could have given it away. Because of course, you know, we all know, or Judas, the man who betrays Jesus, uh, was only ever thinking of the poor, which is why he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So this would be uh, my question that would come up here, is that John also says in there that, oh, and by the way, Judas was also like in charge of the money bag, and that he was skimming off the top, which, you know, the Gospel of John is written well, like years after the events of all of these events are taking place. So that means like they found out like after the fact of what Judas was doing. So he, John is giving some things about Judas's character that the apostles themselves weren't actually aware of like during the time that these things are happening. And there were just a few questions that I kind of had like when I was reading this and it's been really nice kind of going back through and like doing these videos because it gives me time to really like think my way through just the storyline of what's happening and the sequence of events. And one of the things that I kind of asked myself was, how did you just know exactly how much that was worth? <laughs> because that would indicate that he has either bought, sold, or has looked at it before. Two, why was his immediate reaction like, oh, well, we could give it to the poor when they have already up to this point been in different situations where like they really needed money. So even though, yes, they could have given it to the poor, it would have made more sense to have just put it in the money bag or <laughs> to be able to pay for like, I don't, I don't know if during this time, if they had like hostels and things like that where people stayed, because we normally hear about Jesus staying in people's homes, but I kind of wonder if that would have been something that they could have done, especially because they are very quickly going to be on their way to Jerusalem where housing and accommodations are going to be at a minimum because of Passover coming. And then John also says that the Jews, which would be the chief priests in this case, um, they're not talking about the Jewish culture as a whole normally when they're using like this and kind of this derogatory use. Um, they're talking about the people who like thought themselves to be like Jews among Jews. They had decided that Lazarus also needed to die. So they were like, we need to kill Jesus and we need to kill Lazarus. We need to kill Jesus because people are going to start to say that he is king. And if he, they start to see that he is king, then that means Rome is going to be breathing down our necks and we're going to lose all the freedoms that we do have, even though we're under Roman th thumbs. But if we have Lazarus still walking around, then he's proof that this man actually is the king. So we can't have him running around either. So basically they were trying to cover their tracks and the easiest way for them to do that was to kind of make out like the mob and just get rid of anyone and everyone who has something to do with this. Now, they can't just kill Lazarus. They would have to come up with some kind of plan and it would probably have to be an even um, bigger scheme than what they came up with Jesus. Because <laughs> apparently, based on the amount of people who were mourning him, Lazarus was a well respected member of society, so it wouldn't, you'd have to fabricate something, but it would have to be something that would be relatively believable. Okay, then we see a sudden like scene change that takes place. So we've finished kind of the story with like Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, but now Jesus is 
entering Jerusalem and he's entering to shouts of Hosanna. So people are as a wider group and as a culture are recognizing that this is the Messiah and they are shouting and singing in verses 12 through 13 they are singing praises that come out of psalms 118 25 through 26 in verse 15 they are declaring the fulfillment of prophecy from zechariah 9 9 and then in that moment i don't think they all actually realized that this prophecy was being fulfilled because isaiah is jesus entering jerusalem and it is just prophecy after prophecy after prophecy is now being fulfilled and the people don't even totally realize that that's exactly what's happening which there are a few problems <laughs> with this and one is that Israel in and of itself was created to be a theocracy so in order to participate in the wider culture of the people like you had to be actively engaged in synagogue it wasn't like it was not uh What's the nice way to say this? It was not the way we think of America as being a Christian nation where we are associated with your Christian just by virtue of being an American. That's an old idea. It's not really accepted now, but that's what it used to be associated with. Now you have the Jewish people where really, literally like socially, um, politically, uh, religiously everything was tied to the temple and their feasts and their practices um, it, it's very different from how we have traditionally viewed Christian Christianity here within the United States um, as far as like the, the cultural element of it and so <laughs> that, that's one issue but the other issue is that if this is true then that would logically mean that the men and women were being raised in synagogue as they were participating in all these events. So they should have known what they were saying, what they were celebrating, what Jesus entering actually signified. And it appears as though there was some awareness of it because of what they were singing and what they were saying and because john draws it directly back to like here are these prophecies that isaiah had made but it also comes across as they didn't totally get it that none of them actually picked up on the fact that this was a major prophecy that was being fulfilled whenever jesus came in riding on the back of a donkey my opinion here so I think the Jewish people at this time, in this particular moment, were so desperate for this to be the Messiah that they did not confirm the green flags. And that there were though, and this is not to say that like no one picked up on this, I think that there were those who were truly believers, those who were his disciples, who realized, no, this actually is the Messiah, this is why we're following him. And you have people like Nathaniel, who was an Israelite in whom there was no guile. So he, he really did know and understand and get the scriptures. And I think he completely like caught on to exactly what it was that was happening. And I also think that there were others there who didn't, like they really didn't. Um, it would be my prayer for anyone who's watching this that if you're reading through the scriptures that you see the Gospels as being presented and you can see who Jesus is as we are working our way through the Gospel of John that you will go back to scripture and you will confirm it for yourself that you won't be swayed just by me or by someone else that you hear but that you are going to go back to the scripture and you'll read the Gospels for yourself and you will see who God is and what he has done and the gift that he is offering to you and be able to see that you know it's all right there and sometimes we miss it because we're so desperate to see something else so right now that's where i'm ending at for this first part of john chapter 12 probably what i'm going to do is i'll upload it um, over the course of a week just so we can stay on the upload schedule but i hope you enjoyed this and that you will come back for john chapter 12 part 2 which should be up this coming Wednesday. So I look forward to seeing you then next time. Make sure that you like and subscribe so you'll know whenever all of my notifications go up. Bye.